Hey all, it's me again, three times in one day. Anyway, <laughs> so this stream, we're looking at 80s TV from Great Britain. And tonight we're joined by Mike from Clobberin' Times. Hi, Hello Mike. There. Hello there. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be here, sir. Thank you. Thank We've got you. Thank you. Michael from Retro Blasting. I am really excited to be here. Uh, I'm probably going to be doing more listening than talking, just just to soak in all of the British TV knowledge from the from the two of you guys and, and Mike. Of course, he's watched shows I haven't watched. I'm yeah. so excited for this. And once again on this channel, we have Tony from Analog Toys. Hi, right, Dean. We've um, we've swapped places. Last night I was drinking beer, and I think you were on coffee or yeah. something. Now so, I'm on TV. Yeah, on complete, <laughs> complete uh, role reversal. Anyway, so just to get things started, obviously Tony and I have a slight advantage here, but I'm just curious to know what are your memories of British television from the 80s? You want me to go first? Yeah, by all <laughs> means, yeah. Um, de definitely for me, like one of the uh, some of the first videos I ever watched on your channel, Dean, was the Looking Magazine. Oh yeah, Looking Magazine was a was a teen magazine in the UK. My my brother would read it, I would read it, but they would do lots of articles about British TV as well as music and other stuff. And it was almost like a child's really fun, colourful TV guide in in a way. Rather than reading the TV guide, I would look at the Looking Magazine to see what was coming up. There, there was. I remember loads of covers that have got the Robin of Sherwood um, images on the front of them, that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, it actually was branded as a junior TV Times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing was, in the UK, up until 1982, we only had three channels of television. We had BBC One, BBC Two, and ITV. And the Radio Times gave you the listings for BBC One, BBC Two, and all the BBC radio stations and the TV Times gave you listings for ITV. So Lucan Magazine was the ITV listings for kids. And they featured all the sort of cool shows because to the best of my memory, I think the really cool American shows were all broadcast on ITV. And I'm talking A-Team, Knight Rider, Airhawk, or it was Airwolf, sorry, Airwolf, Airwolf. Streethawk. Streethawk. Airwolf. <laughs> Those were all broadcast on ITV, whereas BBC tended to produce their own shows. And uh, also as well, like I said, until 1982, we only had three channels to choose from. And then in 82, we were gifted Channel 4. Mm -hmm. But I don't really remember much in the way of kids' content on Channel 4 when it first came out. It was more aimed at adults, I think. Yeah, same same here. It was um yeah, ITV is where you went for all your American shows. Right, because I remember hearing that they were importing things yeah. like the A team and things like that. Yeah. And run and Buck Rogers and running those, if I recall. Yeah. yeah. I just wanna mm -hmm. just wanna recognize wicked person here. Thank you so much. He's saying in the knots, he got the internet and access to Britcoms. Told folks from the UK, I love your TV. When I told them the shows, they said they're old. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, and um, also as well, so our first topic is going to be British science fiction and adventure shows. Mm -hmm. But before we get into that, I'm going to share a couple of randomly chosen dates in back in time showing what the BBC was giving us on any given day. So the, the BBC website is just a fantastic resource of information and they have their TV listings going back to, I believe, the 60s. So, for a bit of fun, we'll take a look at what was being broadcast on the BBC and we'll see if these sort of ring any bells. So if I can just pull this up, we'll go to our um, first listing. And this one comes from March the 5th, 1981. So, starting at 6.40 in the morning was Open University, and this was just basically educational programming, uh -huh. which would have been of no interest to me as a kid in 81. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is interesting. At 7.55, Closed Down was not a show. 
close down literally meant the channel closed down. <laughs> but but this is going to bring back a lot of memories, I hope. When the channel closed down, they didn't just go blank. They had something on the screen, which I'm hoping... I already know what you're going to put up, Dean. <laughs> okay, does it involve a clown? Yep. A chalkboard? Yep, and a little okay. girl. <laughs> there we go. This was closed down. And what? They, they would have that on screen for any given amount of time. And there would be background music playing. And it was the weirdest thing. Uh, the BBC would have these random shutdowns. And this was their graphic that they would show. It was what they called the BBC test card. And I believe there's some reasoning behind the colors and the patterns, etc. But that's what the that's what the BBC did. There was no programming. It was bizarre. I've seen this, by the way. You know why? Yeah. Life on Mars used it. The really freaky sequence. The the British version, not the terrible American version. Ah. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever seen that. It and it came to life, and it was pretty spooky. Oh wow! So that was the um, BBC's close down. So if I can go back to where we were. So no. <laughs> Right, cue the clown. <laughs> right, yeah. So we <laughs> down. That's the day, everyone. <laughs> yeah, that, so that was an hour and five minutes of weird girl and clown. And then we had TV for schools and colleges, all just more educational stuff. Another closed down for 22 minutes. Midday news. And then Pebble Mill at one was like a, a, a talk show for mm -hmm. housewives to watch. Uh, Tony, do you remember Bod? I don't know. Uh, Bod was a, just a cartoon, um, a very sort of simple cartoon aimed at very young children. You and Me, again, another kid's show. More TV for schools and colleges. Claire Rayner's casebook was an advice column discussing phobias. It's all I, like, that actually sounds interesting. I would, yeah. I would watch that. <laughs> yeah. So... At 3.25, another close down. Before we got the regional news, and in this instance, it was the London news. Play School was a, a show for really young kids. Secret Squirrel was a cartoon, I believe, yeah. from the 60s. Oh, wow. Well, yes, it was. Yeah. And look, this episode, look at that, that is correct. Secret Squirrel in Robin Hood and his Merry Mugs. Yeah. Oh, man, now i got to go find that one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, man, well. I thought I was finished with all that. Crap. Now, <laughs> now, to me, Jack and Ori was an incredibly boring show which involved a celebrity reading a child's story with, you know, random graphics of artwork up on the screen. I hated that show. But then we had Scooby and Scrabby-Doo, which wasn't too bad. News round... <laughs> which interestingly, in this instance, was presented by Paul McDowell. It was normally John Craven. If that rings any bells, he, d he presented Newsround, which was basically a news show for kids. Right. Bl Blue Peter was a very famous show dating back to, I think, at least the 60s. Oh, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's still on, isn't it? I think Quite it is. Possibly, yeah. 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 Um, they would always do you know, craft work and things, and I always remember at Christmas, they would do this Advent candle, which was the ultimate fire hazard, where they would take uh, a coat hanger, wrap it in flammable tinsel, and attach a candle to it, <laughs> and light it for Christmas. And I'm sure a number of houses burned down thanks to Blue Peter's <laughs> uh, Advent ca uh, ca uh, candle. <laughs> the Perishers was another cartoon. And then we had the Evening News followed by regional news. And then for me, that would have been reporting Scotland. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow's World was a great show. That was a show that was showing you the inventions of tomorrow. So for example, it was quite possible they may have been showing CDs at this point in time in 81, possibly. Uh, I always remember them showing off the Sinclair C5 personal transport mobile, if you, if you remember that. It was basically a show of the future. But then at 7.20 was Top of the Pops, which yes. everyone in the UK watched. 
And this episode in particular featured Duran Duran, Shaken wow. Stevens, Phil Collins, The Who, Adam huh. and the Ants, Toya, Motorhead and Girls School, wow. Joe Dolce, Talking Heads, and The Teardrop Explodes. It just, uh, wow. that's, that is a who's who of music of 1981 right there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. We Damn. then had Heidi oh. High, which was a sitcom based in a holiday <laughs> camp. <laughs> a great show. Partners, I believed, was a drama of some sort. I don't remember that at all. The nine o'clock news, Malice, a forethought, was probably a drama <laughs> as well. We then had Question Time, which was a very boring political show where <laughs> members of the public could ask <laughs> questions of the MPs. After the news headlines, we then got Kojak. Oh, wow. I was, oh. Not I was not aware that the BBC was... was uh, syndicating shows from other oh, regions. Yeah, wow. wow. Mad okay. and all those shows. We had okay. Kojak, Kojak, Starsky and Hutch, uh, Mad Dallas, Dynasty. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Then to close things off, we had the weather report, and that was it. It was another close down. I just yeah. have to point something out. Yep. That Kojak episode, it said directed by Jano Schwark, who, yeah. was the, who was the director yeah. of Supergirl and, and Jaws, Jaws, 2. Jaws 2. Wow. Yep. So wow. and, to, and, and Rockford episodes. That's right. Rockford, yeah. I want to quickly acknowledge uh, Jody for the super chat. For Saturday morning cartoons in Holland, we had to rely on British Sky Channel. Interesting. And then I did I miss another one? Uh, Anthony Whitehead, I think. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Anthony. Hey, Anthony, good to see you. Just want to say hello and thank you for... Okay, thank you, Anthony. Very much appreciated. And there was one more... Yep, I missed. Wick, wicked, wicked person. person. Mm -hmm. My impression is that the BBC had a deal with Hanna-Barbera they didn't seem to have with Walt Warner or Disney. So different tunes and Starsky and Hutch. Uh, quite possible. Um, <laughs> I'm thinking back. There were a lot of Hanna-Barbera shown on the BBC, that's for sure. And um, so if I can move on, so I was going to suggest we talked about British produced sci-fi and adventure shows. Mm -hmm. And I know that at least one panelist here is a big fan of Doctor Who. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, would, that, would, that would be Mike Alonzo and I am his um, uh, acolyte. I'm the Christian Slater to his Sean Connery. I'm right. trying to Come learn. On. Trying to so, learn through oh, him. On, I'm just, kidding. I'm just kidding. Just to give you, you my disclaimer. Ever, so yes. my disclaimer here, I did watch Doctor Who when it was on TV in the 80s. However, my only recollection was of Tom Baker, mm -hmm. Peter Davidson, and to a certain extent, Colin Baker. Mm -hmm. After that, I have not seen Doctor Who since. Well, Ooh. but that's all you really need, uh, aside from Sylvester McCoy right at the end of the 80s, to discuss... British right. Doctor Who of the oh, 80s. Yeah. So you're right, you're right in the sweet spot. So. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I saw it first saw it in 1981 over here. It was just started hitting and hitting public television. And um, I read about it in Starlog magazine, things like that. And uh, I don't know if, how much you know about what it was in the 80s here, but Doctor Who was a phenomenon in the US in the 80s. It was huge. It was, I mean, it was gigantic and largely because of Tom Baker, but you know, uh, we didn't know. Many did not know there were doctors previous to him until we started, you know, seeing uh, his episodes, seeing the merchandise come in, the Target books that were adaptations of earlier episodes and things like that. So it just it had a gigantic following here in the U.S. in the 80s in particular, all the doctors, but especially Tom. You know, Tom's the biggest. And even in th through the 90s, it, it remained huge. It really, you don't, you know, you don't hear about that much, but it was a, uh, it was a monster here. We had cons and everything, huge conventions and fan gloves, all over the place. And the '80s was the biggest decade for Doctor Who in the states, and I loved it. That's very, it that's very interesting to me because I've always been under this assumption that a lot of people in America don't even know who Doctor Who is. That's what uh, I always thought. But yeah. what you will, what you will commonly hear from someone who, uh, I, one of the most common things you hear about is. 
uh, if you mentioned that to someone now, or like in the late '90s or into the the 2000s, if you mention Doctor Who to an older person, you'll get two responses. Someone will go, "Oh yeah, I used to watch that with my dad," and then uh, if you talk to their dad, they'll say, "Oh yeah, the guy with the scarf and the curly hair," and that's that's mostly what you're going to get out of the ca the uh, the casual viewer. But the the uh, there is a rabid following that got close to rivaling the following of Star Trek. I dare say in the '80s, there are that many huge uh, Doctor Who fans, and I am one of them, uh, amongst other wonderful science fiction, British science fiction shows. Yeah, my mom used to watch a lot of PBS uh, in the in the 80s when I was growing up. And I would, you know, especially when I was real young and I was still at home, because uh, my memories are just stupid sharp for things that are useless, including being three. And, um, uh, but I remember watching a lot of, you know, early to mid afternoon television with her. Uh, and that included a lot of PBS and she would watch, you know, all of the British imported period dramas that were then couched here as masterpiece theater. So she would watch PBS would call it masterpiece theater and they would play BBC. Uh, and, and I'm, I assume some ITV period, uh, pieces, you know, like, uh, Jane Eyre with Timothy Dalton and things like that. And, uh, I remember catching glimpses of Dr. Who during, you know, that time of my life, but I didn't know what it was. And it's only been recently since I've been actually digging into the series through, you know, my, the DVDs I was buying a few years ago. And now the Blu-ray sets that are coming out. Um, and a lot of the stuff I've screened on BritBox. Uh, I've been telling Mike about this, that certain images and flashes are coming back to me. Like I know for a fact now that my mom flipped by the TV during pyramids of Mars with Tom uh -oh. Baker at one point. Like I didn't I didn't see much of it. It was like I but it but I when I was rewatching it I was like, "Oh my god, it was like this memory trigger. I'm like, I'm 3 years old, I'm eating crushed ice and my mom is flipping channels and and there there's, you know, um the yeah, mummy. so yeah, the the mummy, yeah. Um so yeah, it was a presence on uh, American public television. Yeah. Doctor Who merchandise was huge. I was running, as you know, when well, we did a stream about comic shop yesterday, Michael, as you know, uh, in addition to comics at that shop that I probably didn't even talk about yesterday, is we were selling Doctor Who merchandise by the, you know, by the truckload. It was really a huge phenom. Then, and I'm one of those weirdos. As much as I love Tom Baker, is my favorite. I love all the Doctors. I even, I even look. I love Peter Davison. I love Colin Baker. And uh, I, you know, in spite of some of his stories, and I love Sylvester McCoy, even though the John Nathan Turner era can be, you know, it has been widely criticized. But I'm. Uh, it also got me and a lot of other people interested in other British science fiction and other British shows as well, including, of course, the Hitchhiker's Guide series, and of course. I have an unhealthy exception with Blake Seven, which mm -hmm. I have binge watched. I've seen it every episode. Every year I've watched every episode probably since 1986. I'm that bad. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think <laughs> I think we'll go on to Blake Seven after Doctor Who because I do have some very vivid memories of Blake Seven. But for Doctor Who, now again, you'll have to excuse my terminology because I have not seen this show since the 80s. But I remember there being a half Dalek, half human. Uh, Davros. Davros. Yeah, that terrified me to the point of tears. <laughs> me too. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I remember it straight away. Really? <laughs> Davros yeah. was scary. Okay, cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah when, we were, when we were kids growing up in England, <clears throat> that was a... That was a Pretty scary image to see coming out of you. Yeah. TV. Well, on the rewatch, on the rewatches for me, you know, and, and first time discovery several years back when I was going through them all, um, I used to joke with Mike that that I was finding Doctor Who's classic episodes to be like, and I say this with all compliments in the world, it was like watching Bob Ross, where it was a very comforting show. It had a great pace to it and a great pattern. And I got very comfortable watching it, too comfortable every time I would start an episode. And I would wake up, not because it was boring, because it was it was it was very comforting to watch that show. It had a great production style to it. Well, when Genesis of the Daleks hit, and Davros was in in that episode, um, I remember sitting there, and I, I had the opposite effect. I, I literally was like, I sat up in my chair. So even though I was an adult and I wasn't scared of him, he was very engaging, like on a level where I was very alert and a very very plugged in. Um, so I credit Davros with um, taking Doctor Who from Bob Ross levels to me and taking it, you know, to <laughs> hyper hyper interest for sure. So he, yes, great. Quickly say, 
thank you to uh, D.W. Dum uh, Dumphy, who has said two things. Doctor Who helped give the world Douglas Adams, so yes. Mm -hmm. Then we need to talk about the original YA sci-fi drama, The Tripods. And you know what? That is on my list. So It did give us Douglas Adams. That's true, though. You have a great mind there. Um, so but just quickly going back to Doctor Who, the other thing I do remember from that show were was that some of the sets were, to put it kindly, were pretty damned awful. <laughs> <laughs> Almost made of paper. Yes. But, but that didn't detract from the greatness of the show overall. Mm -hmm. I think we could look past those sets. Yep. Yep. Yeah. The, the writing is the writing is so strong on that show during that period of time. And even even and I don't want to talk out of school, Mike, so keep me honest, but I've I've been watching, you know, even the episodes with uh, in the mid to later 80s where they said, oh, you know, this doctor was bad and they had to cancel the show and then bring in another doctor and all this kind of stuff. And I've watched Colin Baker. I've watched Sylvester McCoy. I mean, it's just like any other television show. They have some really great episodes. They have some standard ones. And then they have, a, you know, one or two that aren't great. But I've never seen, a, a in this era, a bad doctor. I've never seen a bad I mean, performer. Um, I think they're all great yeah. and co compelling. So um, The only one you'll hear complaints about is Colin, for the most part. And I, I don't agree with it, but, I, you know, that's fine. A lot of people didn't like his look. I love McCoy and I love Colin. I think Colin did get the short end of the stick a little bit with what Michael Gray did to the BBC back then who had it in for the show, hated the show, the right. controller of the time. Michael, Michael Gray, the D BBC controller, hated Doctor Who. He destroyed it. And uh, it's a shame. And a lot of people criticize the John Nathan Turner era. I'm a big fan, of, more of a fan of Barry Letts and Philip Hinchcliffe, but that had some good ones too, like I said, Michael. So, I'm very conflicted on Michael Gray because of things I've learned recently. So it all has to do with Maybe. 80s TV. I found out that even though I, I want to, you know, reach through, you know, time machine or TARDIS, if you will, and stop him from canceling Doctor Who, I all by stopping him from even being in the the BBC <laughs> controller, I also found out that he's pretty much single handedly responsible for Kylie Minogue's rise to fame because he moved neighbors to after school, um, oh, yeah. and um, wow. that's right. So I it would be like those Star Trek episodes where. They go back to the assassination of JFK and they're like, we can stop it, but should we? And I'm like, I could stop the cancellation no. of Doctor Who, <laughs> but if I do, then Kylie might not be a thing. You know, it's a, you know. This Michael's deep, dark soul decision. Yeah. Okay. So I just want to catch up on these super chats. So Master Son 42 has said, this is interesting. The British shows I saw were The Young Ones and Benny mm -hmm. Hill. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And cartoon wise on Nickelodeon. They had Danger Mouse and Count Docula. That oh, is yep. interesting. That's good I love to know Danger that. Mouse. Yep. Yeah. Um, Bradshaw Studios like the fourth Doctor. And thank you for the super chat. And we have one more here I missed, which was Klonaztev Dream Killer. He said, God, I in the UK in the late 80s because his dad was in the US Air Force. This is almost making me get misty-eyed with nostalgia. Well, <laughs> that's what it's all about, is the nostalgia. Yeah. And um, it's just its so amazing that I made a few notes for this broadcast. And in those notes, I've already had people commenting on some of the shows that I was going to mention. So obviously, we're all thinking along the same lines. So on the subject of sci-fi and adventure, another show that I know for a fact that Michael has enjoyed was Robin of Sherwood. Yes, yes. Tony, did you watch that growing up? Uh, for me personally, that was my second favorite show, British show of the 1980s. Mm -hmm. You might be surprised to know that my number one show is Wurzel Gummidge, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Which brings nice. us back to who again? So, yes. Nice. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I had a Wurzel Gummidge doll with interchangeable heads when I was a kid. I loved that thing. Um, <laughs> oh. But no, there was something about the Robin of Sherwood TV show that was just magical um, up until Sean Connery's son came into it, but never yeah. mind. <laughs> you, know, you, you know, okay, so so Robin of Sherwood was one of the um, channels that I remember, or sorry, one of the, one of the series that I remember when my parents got like a six month, maybe it was a year 
uh, early cable package. They got the the wood grain, faux wood grain box with a big turn knob in the center. And uh, we had finally for once we had cable. We had for a br- very brief moment. I want to say it was in '84. Um, and Showtime played Robin of Sherwood. And I had already grown up with. I was. I'm. I'm lucky that my parents. My, my mom really. Um, she loved the classics, and so I had grown up watching Errol Flynn's Robin Hood, and I was also watching the Disney one with the fox. And so when I saw this modern television show about Robin Hood, and he looked so cool, like Michael Prade just oh, had this yeah. great look, you know, yeah. as Robin. And the they have never had a forest like that in a Robin Hood movie since. It really felt like the Greenwood, you know, like he they're running through thick, dense you know, forested yeah. areas. There's not just like manicured trees with mown grass in between them because they're at a national park or something. Like they're in the middle of the woods. Um, great cinematography, everything. But I would watch that show when I could catch it. And then my parents took took cable away because they didn't want to pay for it. And so I never knew that he was recast with Jason Connery. Mm-hmm. I never knew that. And I only recently just watched the Jason Connery seasons as part of my, I bought the Blu-ray from England network, did a great Blu-ray set of it. Highly recommended to any fan of the show. And um, I got to the Jason Connery scenes and Melinda happened to come into the room while I was watching them. And I said, you know, I've heard all about how the show just died because of Jason Connery. And I'm like, I, I don't really have a problem with Jason Connery. I think I have a problem with where the writers took the plots um, yeah, it sucked that Michael Prade left and went on to other things like, what was that, Night Flyers, which that was a flop. Um, but I, I didn't have a problem with Jason Connery taking over the role and being a different person. I, I actually enjoyed some of his performances quite well uh, in episodes. It was more the plots around him that were strange, like finding the round table of King Arthur and uh, stuff like that. That was more where I had an issue. I'm just going to catch up on these uh, super chats. So Brendan has kindly sent in five dollars. Banana Man, remember that gem? I certainly oh, do. And Banana yeah. Man <laughs> is right there on my list. And nice. Crime Syndicate has said in Australia in the '80s, kids' British TV was on the afternoon show. Young ones, the Goodies, Banana Man, Super Ted, and the best of all, Danger Mouse. Yes. Absolutely. That's uh, incredible that, that these shows made it all over the world. Um, so, yes. so going back to the Robin of Sherwood, I was obviously a, a kid at the time, and I couldn't comprehend that Jason Connery with blonde hair was the same character <laughs> as Michael Pred with dark hair. And my mum had to explain it to me, and it just did not register. And for whatever reason, I just could not watch the show again. Uh huh. Same thing happened to me. Yeah, I, I totally get it. I totally get why it's got to be very throwing. As I had the advantage of seeing the transition as right. a forty-year-old, and so yeah. I saw, you know, the whole thing of Hearn finds another champion. He's now the son of Hearn. It is a little convenient that his name is Robert. Hmm. Um, it also it's also a little convenient that you know Marion also starts to fall in love with him. Uh, but o- other than that being kind of too convenient, I didn't really have a problem with him as a performer in the in the show um but i do i do agree that michael prade is the icon of yeah of that show yeah and also can we take a moment to acknowledge and i think the band was called clanad mm-hmm. who did the theme song yes it was a they were they were basically like a, like a folk outfit who would sometimes have almost hits in the uk but robin the hooded man that was their big hit and listening to it now, it's a great piece of music. It really is. Mm-hmm. And it I took, think it, sorry, go ahead. No, I just think it, it just fit the show perfectly. It was it was funny. Uh, Melinda had to school me on what they were singing in the uh, in the uh, opening because I was re- I was rewatching it, <laughs> and she came down. She came down, and I was like. She says, oh, so how are you enjoying this? I know you haven't seen this since you were a kid in the 80s. And I'm like, yeah, the, the episode's really cool. I'm like, the music, a little weird, though. And she and she, I was playing the music. She goes, well, that's Clannad. She, knows, she loves Clannad. And she said, they're great. And I said, yeah, I mean, like, the music is great. I said, but the lyrics are just bonkers. And she yeah. goes, "She goes, what are you talking about? And I said, well, listen to the, the opening. And I you know, played her the opening. 
And she goes, okay, so? And I was like, they go, Robin, a glue, glue, glue. And, and she goes, she goes, no, they're saying the hooded man. And I yeah. went, they are? And she's like, yeah. And I'm like, oh. And then I like had to rub out my ears and then it finally clicked for me. It was like learning to ride a bike. I was like, oh, yeah. they are saying the hooded man. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've got another super chat here again from Frame Syndicate saying, anyone remember the TV adaption of Adrian Mole? I do remember it, but I wasn't allowed to watch it because it was after the watershed and I had very strict parents and they wouldn't let me watch it. But I remember I was probably primary six or primary seven and other kids were discussing it, saying they were talking about him measuring his penis and all this and that. I'm like, oh boy. But yeah, I missed out on that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I never watched that either. I do remember reading the books, um, yeah. probably a little bit later in, in, in my life. But yeah, I never remember the TV ad adaptation. No. Now, still on the subject of sci-fi and adventure, it's already been mentioned in the chat, but The Tripods was another terrifying BBC-produced sci-fi show. Does anyone here recall seeing that? So I've got some bad recollections of it. Yeah. yeah, same here. Same here. I did see it. But the one that really scared me was the Day of the Triffids. Oh, yeah. yeah. Which was, again, BBC produced with these killer plants. And obviously, given it was the BBC, the budget wasn't the greatest. And the special effects were pretty awful. But as a kid in very early 80s, it was absolutely traumatizing. Uh I remember it giving me nightmares. <laughs> so I've got one last show under the guise of sci-fi, which could also fall into our children's category, but Terror Hawks, the Jerry Anderson show, did that make yeah. its way to America? Yes. Sorry. Yep. I never got to see it, but it did. It, it, uh, it, it, was, it was made it... I, don't know who ran it, but I do have a lot of friends who are Jerry Anderson, Super Marionation fans. Yeah. Super Marionation is go, by the way. Right. Yeah, <laughs> because because the villainess of that show, who I think her name was it Zelda, possibly, or yeah. I think she so, was yeah. this haggard looking witch like character. And even though it was a puppet, that's that thing scared me as well. I mean, I guess I was easily scared as a kid. But some of the, the effects on these early sci-fi shows were pretty convincing for a kid of eight or nine years old. And now, was, uh, was Terror Hawks the that was one of the last kind of Jerry Anderson shows, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. I don't know if it was the last, but um because obviously back back in those days we were still watching reruns of 60 Thunderbirds and stuff like that. But uh I, I remember particularly enjoying Terror Hawks. It was a it was a real highlight. Uh, TV highlight of my childhood. Yeah. Now, if I recall rightly, that was broadcast on a Sunday afternoon. Yeah, that would sound about right, yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if England got... Did you ever get Glenn Michaels' cartoon cavalcade? Why does that sound so familiar? Hmm. That title not, sounds familiar, but yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm not getting anything past that. I've heard that title. So, so Glenn Michael was a Scottish TV personality... And his sidekick, Paladin, was a talking paraffin <laughs> lamp. <laughs> wow. I mean, I mean, as one would expect. Yeah. Right. And yeah. they would basically introduce cartoons on a Sunday afternoon. And they had some pretty interesting cartoons that I remember watching. And I've discussed it with people uh, that I used to work with. And they don't remember it. Do you remember a cartoon called Wonder Wheels? where it was a guy on a clapped out motorcycle and he would say, one, 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 wonder wheels. And the, it would turn into this amazing super bike and he'd become this superhero. Oh God, you are, you are literally giving me strange, like in the <laughs> archive flashes of yeah. synapse Wasn't memory. Wasn't American show? Yeah. Oh, absolutely yeah. American. Yeah, yeah. I, am, I am definitely yeah. remembering that. Good. I'm glad to hear that I'm not alone in this. It existed. Um, I know that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, you're, this is this is going to be an existential experience for me on this live stream. I can already tell. Yeah. All right. So we've got another super chat from a world made of cardboard. Thank you very much. He says, anyone remember Sapphire and Steel? Oh, David yeah. McCallum and Joanna Lumley, very scary sci-fi. 
I remember the name, but I don't recall ever seeing the show. I, I know, I know the show. I haven't, I haven't had access to it, but I do know the show right. um, because I, I'm yeah. a big, I'm a big uh, David McCallum fan, going all the way back to uh, Mosquito Squadron, The Great Escape, and of course, one of my favorite TV shows of all time, which I know doesn't hit the '80s, but Cold It's. Um, it's one of my favorite television shows. So yeah, Dave McCallum, uh, major props to him. Um, well, I loved him. I loved him on Man from Uncle, of yes. course. Yeah. And yes. the Invisible Man. And you know, I've only seen a, a very a bit of Sapphire and Steel, which is a shame because I do have burned copies that a friend made for me a while back. And every time I hear someone raving about it, I need to go back and watch it. And I plan to because it is very popular and very well loved, and I respect it a lot. I can't wait to watch it again. Let me watch it all the way. I've, I've just caught a, a chat here that I need to bring up from Brendan, who says that Windsor Davis was the best Sergeant ma Major ever in Ain't Half Hot Mom. And yeah, I love that show. Yeah. And it's funny because as with all the sitcoms I've been re-watching now, I watched those shows as a kid and I would enjoy the slapstick humor. And that was as far as it went for me. But watching it now, all the adult humor that went over my head as a kid is mm -hmm. just top-notch writing. Um, we'll get to comedy in the next section, but I just want, I wanted to bring that up because Windsor Davis was fantastic. He really was. So before we go into our next segment, I'm going to do another quick look at what the BBC was giving us. So this time we're jumping to December 24 of 1985. So we have, starting in the morning, we had CFAX. Now, CFAX was basically, before the internet, it was like an information service where if you had a CFAX-enabled television, you could program in certain pages to read information. So, for example, the English Premiership, or I guess it was called First Division back then, but they would have a certain page you could key into your remote control and read information on the various scores that day. There would be different pages for music or whatever for kids' things. It was it was quite interesting back then. And this, I guess, replaced the close down that we used to have at the beginning of the decade. Then we had breakfast time, which was just a, a breakfast chat show. The Littlest Hobo, if I remember rightly, was about a dog. Does anyone else recall that show? Yeah, I've I, I've got some some vague recollections of that as well. Yeah, yeah. The Hunter, I think, was another '60s cartoon, possibly. Um, not entirely sure, but play chess. I remember watching. There was a show teaching kids how to play chess. Hmm. And then, of course, being Christmas time, we had the Charlie Brown Christmas. Yay! Now, Magic Roundabout, I think is a pretty famous show because I believe it was uh, produced by a guy who was heavily into his LSD. Yeah. And <laughs> as a result, the show itself is best enjoyed whilst on LSD. <laughs> I, I, I really think that's, that's innovative interactive TV though. I mean, I yeah. think, I think that really, you know, predates and, and predicts things like captain power. So I got to give it props for, right. you know, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> play school very much for infant kids. Then a bit of Tom and Jerry. Nice. Uh, mm -hmm. Charles in Charge. <laughs> um, uh, featuring Scott Bale. I don't mm -hmm. recall ever seeing this. Yeah, popular sitcom over here. Ah. Was, yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, popular sitcom over here. Sorry, you had to get it over there. Yeah. yeah. Sorry about <laughs> um, that. They were syndicated that, or something. Yeah. yeah. See here. Now, that was a show for the deaf. I remember that much because I remember getting so annoyed when that came on because it was just people doing sign language for the best part of an hour. <laughs> Junior Kickstart. Remember that, Tony? I don't know. Oh, my God. Kickstart was like uh, the. Uh, <laughs> It was like a, a, a what do you call it? Hell, the um, motocross. Motorcycle. You had to go over the obstacle course. Oh. It was a pretty exciting show. Uh, we had the news. Mm -hmm. We had Cliff Richard hosting a song for Christmas. And we all know that would have sucked. 
145 was Mr. Ben, another classic BBC cartoon. Remember that one, Tony? I do, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just jumping in here quickly. Uh, wicked person. Oops, why is it disappearing? The Littlest Hobo, a Canadian product. Okay. Mm, there you go. Good to know. I just assumed it was American, but there you go. The Slipper and the Rose was the story of Cinderella, the British film musical. So that would have been, for me, a pretty awful show to have to endure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and again, Keith Keith and Orville's Christmas Circus. That's like family viewing. But uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Orville the Duck. I feel like Tony is having a moment here with the, the announcement of this particular title. I would love to know what's going on in his head right now. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, when we did the, the stream yesterday with Dean about the Argos catalogs, it actually you had the Orville duck puppet in there, but it was so annoying. Oh, and my shit. sister loved it. We had uh -huh. to have the Orville duck puppet in the house, and I hated this thing. Well, and don't forget their hit single, I Wish I Could Fly. <laughs> it's like, I wish I could fly right up to the <laughs> sky, but I can't. You can. I can't. You can. Oh, oh. <laughs> and it, it was it's, Keith Orville. It's terrible. Keith, Keith Harris with his hand up Orville's ass, obviously, controlling the mouth. <laughs> and it was just the more, even as a kid, I knew it was so irritating. So I can only imagine for adults being forced to watch this, it must have been sheer torture. <laughs> yeah. so, and then following Keith Harris or Keith and Orville's Christmas Spectacular, we then had carols from King's College, which would have been equally torturous. Yeah, I, I would have flipped over to ITV. And if that wasn't <laughs> bad enough, we then had the news. And then we had, ooh, controversial, Jim will fix it for Christmas. <laughs> So I'm sure you're all familiar with the story of uh, Jimmy Savile. Yes. yes. Oh, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. So we'll, we'll just skip by that. Then Telly Addicts <laughs> yeah. Christmas Special. So Telly Addicts was like a, a, I guess it was a quiz show based on uh, television or, sh or questions based on television shows. Um, I don't, so I guess Barry took was the uh, host. Um, I vaguely remember that name. Then we had East Enders, which I just remember as being the most depressing soap opera ever made. It was just <laughs> grey. Everything about it was grey as far as I remember. It never, the, the sun never shone. The, the, uh, st the uh, studio sets were dingy and there was always some horrible um, mishap going on that caused a lot of tension. Awful, awful show. Kenny it's still Everett, like that now, but I, yeah. I, I do remember like um, just the character of Dirty Den. Like the, the, he was the main sort of villain in the show. And oh yeah, you got. But I think that's when when Neighbours was. I don't know if it was when Neighbours was brought to the UK or like Michael was saying when they put it to a, an after school time slot. You had this dingy, depressing East Ender show, or you could watch Jason Donovan and Kylie oh, yeah. Minogue. It, yeah. The, two, three years later, my family moved to Australia because of watching that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was night and day. I, I just remember yeah. about Neighbours just being this colourful, sunlit scene, and then you would maybe wait a couple of hours, East Enders would come on, it would be the East End of London in the grey, raining uh, set. Terrible, terrible show. But Kenny Everett's Christmas Carol would have been fun. I'm sure Kenny Everett was... Did he make it to America? Um, mm. Not that I'm aware of. Mm. Doesn't ring a bell. Yeah. Um, a Question of Sport was like a, a fun-filled quiz show based on sports, and they had sports personalities... Uh, as contestants. Terry and June was another sort of fun sitcom. I remember watching that. And then we had the news, then we had Cagney and Lacey. Mm. I, I love that show. Oh, yeah. Um, I remember my grandma was a big fan of that show. <laughs> uh, then Val Dunican's Christmas Party. Do you remember that, Tony? 
<laughs> yeah, Pat he Boone. Was, <laughs> he was like this crooner who wore, you know, festive sweaters in a rocking chair with a pipe and sang Christmas carols and things. It was all sort of good natured. Then we had the Good Life Christmas Special, another sitcom. And then we had the First Communion of Christmas, followed by the weather, and that was it. The BBC was off until Christmas Day. So before we go on, I saw a super chat. I think I missed. Um, and it was wicked person. Every day I was in England, people told me I was incredibly lucky. The sun was shining. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Like, um, believe it or not, when I was back in Scotland a couple of years back, I couldn't believe the sun was out. I thought, what's going on here? This is not normal British weather. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, mean, I lived in England for the first 11 years of my life. And um, yeah. w when I came to Australia, it's not just that it's, it's very sunny here. The, the sky looks different. The sky looks a long way up yeah. in Australia. In England, it's like... The sky starts at the roof of your house. Yep. It's, right. It's, it, it feels it's, it's a very unless someone has been to both countries, it's a very difficult thing no. to try and explain. And, and it's mm -hmm. like over here, even in New York, uh, around just after probably twelve thirty in the afternoon, the sun is directly overhead, and that never happened in Scotland. No. <laughs> Although in Scotland it was still light in summer until. 10 10 30 in the at night it was still it was still light enough to be able to play outside but over yeah. here it gets dark a lot earlier um, yeah but then, but, then, but then in winter it's pitch black at four o'clock <laughs> yeah yeah um i find it interesting you use military time yeah yeah i guess i kind of grew up with that actually i don't know i think he's talking about the bbc website dean yeah Although that, that, I, that was I still a 24 do, hour clock, so. I, I still do use that when I when I talk about the time. Uh, another one from a world made of cardboard. Does the BBC show bloopers on Christmas Day? Um, sadly, neither Tony and I can confirm or deny that we've not been there. Um, so the next topic I wanted to get into was the comedy shows that were shown from the BBC or, or from Britain in the 80s. So quickly, what were some of your favorite 80s British comedies? Tony, please. Only Fools and Horses. <laughs> Only Fools and Horses. That's, um, yep. it's, it, it's a timeless show that I still rewatch. Um, uh, a, a, bit, a bit like what you were saying before, uh, Dean. Uh, even as a kid, I enjoyed a lot of the, the slapstick side of it and then was yeah. getting more of the adult humour later in life. But <clears throat> the one thing with, with that show in particular is that it, it started out as this kind of pure comedy, but later on into the series when Rodney meets Cassandra and, yeah. and Dell meets Raquel, it actually turned into this really heartfelt, drama as, as as well there's some there's some great acting in it um i absolutely adore that that series and it's one of the probably one of the few 80s tv shows that i still re-watch today yeah before we go on just want to say again thank you to brendan who said that when windsor davis did an in-character safety video for the RAF in the 1980s if only all safety films were that amusing on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as a matter of fact, one of the one of the eighties uh British uh things that I grew up watching and now have on DVD is related to the RAF and that's uh I don't believe it was a BBC production. I could have that wrong, but it was a uh, piece of cake, which was about the RAF pilots in World War II and it was a mini series that highly recommended to anybody that loves World War II. I know that's not a comedy. Uh as far as comedies go, uh Tony was kind enough to recommend Only Fools and Horses to me just a few months ago yeah. and then bequeathed to me uh, the entire collection, which I'd been watching it on BritBox, but now I've been watching it in, you know, really nice quality. Mm -hmm. Brilliant show. Oh, yeah. So funny. Um, the, the way that the characters interplay, uh, the way that those two brothers 
I mean, Melinda sometimes looks over at me when I'm watching it and she's like, God, this is like you and your brother. And I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> like, it really yeah. is. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, and it's funny because it, some of the lines from that show made it into my everyday life. So if you remember, I think Trigger used to call Rodney Dave. Uh-huh. Yeah. And we had a we had a friend in our circle whose name was Roderick. But because of that, we called him Dave. He was then called Dave. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was yeah. such a cultural phenomenon in, in the UK. Like, I, I, I don't know any English person who hasn't at one time in their life used the phrase in general conversation, lovely jubbly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Absolutely. I just I just love the way that the one guy was always dragging his rather insecure and 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 lack lacking in confidence younger brother into all of these just ridiculous schemes. I mean like every <laughs> single time. Like and they weren't even like they were uh, the thing I loved about the uh, love about the show in the present tense is that because I'm I'm experiencing it, you know, fresh is is that his schemes are not I mean yeah, they're they're opportunistic, but they're not they're not um, sadistic or anything like he's no, not no. he's not trying to hurt anybody but no. he's he's trying to get a leg up you know he's trying yeah. to get that advantage um, but he has just the most I mean he could almost he could almost compare notes with Skeletor as to who has the better plans <laughs> you know for the, for the you know um, it's such a great it's such a great show it really is now, now when the actor that played the father died in real life and the character was replaced by Uncle Albert. Were you able to immediately accept that change, or was that a bit of a, a problem for you? Well, I, I think for me, watching it as a child, I think I first started watching during the Uncle Albert era because oh, okay. I was really been too right. young when when Granddad was around. So, okay. um, so that that never bothered me. But um, um, looking back at it now, I, I think Uncle Albert is a fantastic character. Oh, yeah. But during the war. <laughs> so, <laughs> now, was Uncle I've Albert... I've got a lot of army friends who will uh, use that phrase against me. Oh, here he goes with another army story <laughs> during the war. <laughs> was, now, was Uncle Albert played by Jason Connery as well? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so we got another... Thought... Oh, go ahead, sorry. Super chat here. Uh, British humor is the greatest. Black Adder, yes, Prime Minister, Rumpole, and Faulty Towers. Yep, can't argue with that at all. Love them, uh, absolutely. And then That's another one from Wolfie762. Thank you so much. Grew up on the Canadian New York border, and thanks to the CN Tower, we got CTV and CBC. I remember seeing Black, Ar Black Adder, Allo Allo, along with Royal Canadian Air Force. Not sure if this showed in the UK. I don't recall seeing that. Yeah, I've never seen anything called Royal Canadian Air Force. And trust me, if I had heard that title before today, I would have already seen it. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, another comedy from the 80s that I am a huge fan of is Are You Being Served? Mm. Yes. Um, yes. Again, just to give you my perception, another show that I watched as a kid with the family and laughed at the slapstick, but only seeing it now did I realize that 90% of it was above my head as a kid. <laughs> and uh, some of the scenes uh, with Mrs. Slocum and her feline friend are just, I, I cannot believe that was shown b before the watershed on British television. I, I mean, I can't speak for British BBC or anything like yeah. that, but I mean, she is using an alternative definition of that word, yeah. which refers to felines. I know yeah. it's all innuendo, of course, but technically, <laughs> technically she's yeah. referring to a cat. <laughs> yeah. So, you know. Yeah. There was just one that stuck in my mind where something or other caused a, a scare in her apartment, and she proclaimed that the hairs on her pussy were standing up on end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um I, I i can't remember guys did melinda's in the chat did ab fab start in the 80s or did it start in the 90s oh very I, late I, 80s i think i think okay. it started in the late 80s if i remember right. okay yeah, it, 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 it does it does um 
it, to, to me, it's it's more of a 90s show, but I, I think it did start like 89, something like that. Okay, so much in the way Hero Turtles started in the 80s, but then ended up yeah. being popular in the 90s. Yeah, yeah she's, she's a huge AbFab fan. She's like, did they talk about AbFab? So... <laughs> but yeah, but yeah. yes, back to Are You Being Served? Yeah, yeah. Melinda and I, uh, I I saw Are You Being Served in syndication when I lived in England in the early 90s. Right. And and it was on the Comedy Channel and then um, on Sky. And then um, when I came back, you know, I always remembered that show. And then we got BritBox and I saw it in the BritBox library. Melinda and I went through the, the whole series mm -hmm. and she really fell in love with it too because, oh, yeah. because the humor is so smart. You know, it's it quick. It's quick and witty, and and um, the comebacks are so not, not. They're cutting, but I don't mean like they're brutal. They're just yeah. they're cutting and just sharp as a tack. I mean, it's it's got such a great patter to the and dialogue. It, it also kind of highlighted the the class system we had in place back then, mm -hmm. where unless you were upper management, you couldn't address another person by their first name. And uh, only was it Mr. or Captain Peacock? Mm -hmm. He was the floor walker. It was his job to stand around all day and uh, direct customers to the to the various counters. I mean, what a job that must have been! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, what are they? What is is was is that why there was so much? Uh, what did they call that? Did they call it labor action? Oh, uh, you. There was a phrase over in England for the strikes of the. Of the 70s and and early 80s it wasn't called labor action but it was something action i can't remember but uh you know uh, elizabeth sladen used to talk about how they couldn't move a chair you know yeah. on a set if the guy was at tea you know and so they'd, right. they'd, be, they'd be trying to figure out well how can we get this chair two inches literally into the camera shot that we've yeah. elizabeth can you can you go over there and just kind of fall into the chair and maybe it'll scoot it you know like two inches so yeah, yeah. i can see how there would be a guy that would just lead customers to the right counters. Yeah. Uh, you know? Yeah. Now, in terms of um, comedy sketches, for me, anyway, my favorite has to be the two Ronnies. Oh. Was and, that 80s? Was that 80s? Well, 70s and 80s. Okay. And yeah. love it. again, yeah, the two, the two Ronnies was, was on for a long time. Oh, yeah. For most of the 80s, yeah. But I, again, it's one of these things where I used to watch it with my family as a kid and, and would laugh at what I thought was funny. But having rewatched it all again, it's like, oh my God, I missed out on so much because I didn't understand it. It was the wordplay that those guys used that is second to none. Um, obviously, the most famous sketch of all British comedy has to be Four Candles. Do you know that one? Yeah. Have you seen that one, Michael? I, I I know I know the two Ronnies, but I haven't seen I haven't seen that one. I, I have a I have another British comedy that has completely uh -huh. absorbed all my time that I'll mention uh, yeah. after after this. Um, yeah, and, I, and I'll tell you that's why I haven't gotten around to that one. Right. So please continue. But if you if you get the chance, just go on YouTube. Two Ronnies, four candles, mm -hmm. and it's the best bit of wordplay you'll probably ever see. It it will never be surpassed. And uh, again, with they had a good mixture of slapstick, but also really intelligent, well-written comedy. And that was the secret to their success because anyone can do slapstick. Right. It was the precise wording of some of their lines that I, I don't know how they did it, to be honest. It was absolute genius. Um, yeah, and I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was just gonna say, Please go ahead. Oh no, I I feel like you're actually by coincidence describing how I how I fell into this this other show that I saw you know partly in syndication when I lived over there and then Melinda and I binge watched it, mm -hmm. which is a bit of Fry and Laurie. Love which, it. Yeah, it's a great which, show. Yeah, which has that same surgically precise, forensically precise dialogue that's sharp, very very intelligent. Yeah. Um, and it forces you to kind of keep up with its humor. Mm -hmm. um, and you when, when you finally find that groove with it, um, you know, somebody else who's never seen it can walk into the room and be like, what are you laughing at? I'm like, you, you got to give this three episodes. And then once you're, you know, you're oh, in. It was um, brilliant. Brilliant yeah. show. 
Love it. And the thing as well with something like the two Ronnies, they were able to be quite smutty without being smutty in the slightest. Mm -hmm. As opposed to modern comedy, I remember watching one in the, in the last five or six years. It was called, I think, Two Broke Girls. Uh huh. And they depended purely on the smut factor, and it just was not funny. Yep. Not in the slightest. But with the two Ronnies, it was the subtleties that gave it the, the edge. Yes. Yeah, um, there's no subtlety anymore. No, I just need to no. catch up here. So Wicked Person, again, thank you. Carry On Dick and the other Carry On films. Yep, absolute British classics. Um, I th think... Did I miss any? Uh, you got one from uh, Gen X Toys about Black Adder. There we go. That's so Jody one. has said, I was trying to super chat part of the Black Adder theme lyrics, but somehow YouTube won't let me. So you'll have to recall the theme song yourself. That's um, from Black Adder, the first one. The first, there were four different, you know, some regular series, six yeah. episode series. He's talking about the, there were lyrics to the first theme. Huh. And, uh, he did put it in there. I saw it. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I don't remember. I've, I've watched all of the Black Adder, but at, at the time it was being released, the only one I really go back and watch is Black Adder Goes Forth. Um, mm. I've, I've seen that it's, numerous times. Oh, that's wonderful. I mean, they're all great, though, and, and I love them all. I mean, that's one of the most quotable shows ever. I mean, I, I watch the episodes, those episodes over and over again, even the wonderful Christmas Carol, Black Adder's Christmas Carol they did, and then later they came back with Black Adder back and forth. Uh, it's one of the greatest, I mean, one of the most quotable shows I've ever seen. And uh, again, Wicked Person, thank you, has said, Spitting Image was incredibly rude and hilarious. Yes. Yeah, well, yes. Do you know, my, my, my strongest memories of Spitting Image is actually, um, the chicken I've got song. quite a large family in the UK, oh. like lots of uncles and aunties, lots of cousins, and it seemed like every year we would go to a holiday camp like Butlins or Pontins. The whole family would go. And I remember being in a, in a dance hall and all of us cousins, we knew all the words to all of the Spitting Image songs, like Star Trek in Across the Universe and, and <laughs> Throw a Chicken. And, you know, and it would just get played on repeat in the dance hall and we just <laughs> sing all these Spitting Image yeah. songs. And although that was one of the downsides of the UK, they always allowed, or, or the people, I should say, bought these ridiculous comedy songs that went to number one in the charts. Yeah. Um, I remember Star Trek in being number one. The Chicken Song was number one. Oh, terrible songs, but funny to look back on, I'm sure. I um, would rather have that, Dean, than... Yeah. All the number ones we get from oh, yeah, Pop oh, yeah. and X Factor nowadays. So. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> um, so I didn't actually tee this up yet, so I'm going to let you guys continue talking. So any other British comedy that rings a bell with you? Oh, yeah. Well, I'd like yeah. to know what the Americans think of Blackadder. It's I love – yeah, go ahead, Mike. You haven't no, done no, a lot of talk. No, no, go ahead. You, I, no, I'd love to hear your take. Well, like I, I was just saying, it's uh, I love Rowan Atkinson. I love that show. All of them. Brian Blessed was absolutely fantastic in the first series. And you think, wow, that was so funny. And yet the character of Black Adam, what's great about him is in that first one, he's just this little slimy little weasel. And then you watch Black Adder 2, and he's the coolest. From there on, 2, 3, and 4, he was the coolest character, even though he still screwed up. Tony Robinson is brilliant all the way through it as well. Wonderful cast. Unbelievably quotable, and I probably watched him more than any human being ever should watch the show. <laughs> watch him that much. I just, it's so quotable, as I said, and uh, Black Adder Goes Forth has one of those, I mean, for a comedy like that, to have that ending, and I know you were mentioning, Tony, that you've seen it, I guess. Have you seen it, Michael? That oh, yeah. I've seen, I've, seen all, I've seen all of Black Adder. Yeah. That's a brutal ending for a comedy, mm -hmm. but yeah. it was yeah. it really gets to you right there. Yeah, um, I I remember seeing Black Adder, of course, uh, on reruns when I lived in, in England, and then I've since rewatched all of it on on uh, BritBox, and um, I just I just love seeing the progression through time, how they didn't get stuck in a rut. They 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 I love the fact that somebody you know looked at it and said, hey. Let's let's just move through time with these same performers playing 
different characters that change up the dynamic and, and make it poignant. Um, and yeah. I also, I also, that kind of um, created a kind of fixation for me, a, a positive fixation with Tony Robinson, because um, I have watched every single episode of Time Team, every oh, wow. single one. And uh, I love archaeology, especially, you know, British and European archaeology and history. So uh, then when I was doing all this research for this will bring us back around to I want to say this is the 80s, but it might be the early 90s. I can't remember. Um, I was doing all this Robin Hood research and I found out about Maid Marian and her Merry Men, which was created by Tony Robinson. So I now have that that I'm watching. Oh, cool. um, yeah. So it's it's crazy. Robinson's fantastic. Yeah. So I just want to catch up on these chats. So again, D.W. Dunphy has said, I'll bring up Eric Idle's Rutland Weekend Television. Neil Innes, rest in peace. I have always thought in the back of my mind, cheese and onions. <laughs> <laughs> and there were more, I think. Yeah, there's, there's one from Melinda. There. Melinda. Melinda. So Melinda, thank you very much, has said, what happened when the broadcast day ended in the 80s in the UK? Here it was a national anthem, then static. Exactly okay. the same in the UK. They would so tell we'll be... you what was on the following day, give you the weather forecast, and play God Save the Queen. <laughs> And the, uh, the 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 image you put up right near the start of this, the the stream with the girl and the chalkboard yeah. playing noughts and crosses with with the clown, there's um, different coloured bars on the, the the tops, the side and the bottom, and and the idea was that you could use that to optimise the colour setting on your TV, but they would give you eight hours through the night to do six hours. <laughs> yeah, it's a five minute job, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then we have wicked person again. Thank you. I said. Black Adder goes fourth, had the Blake seven ending. Yes, it did. <laughs> it did kind of have that. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I actually remember on, on the Blake seven finale as a, as a kid, I don't know what age I was, but I was distraught. I was sobbing like an absolute baby when that happened. It's brutal. I'll tell you that last episode, which is entitled Blake. Um, it's weird. All of, all of my feel good shows that I go to, my go to shows, if I'm going to, you know, if you're depressed, I don't know. We, we all have, as geeks, we have certain things we love that cheer us up. There's nothing cheerful about that episode. And yet I watch it. And for some reason, it, I get it. Because I'm, again, I'm also unhealthily obsessed with Blake Seven. I've watched it way too many times. And uh, that last episode gets me, but in a good way, like that last Black Adder episode. Even though, as a fan, you shouldn't like it because it's, it's the end and it's brutal, but it's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, speaking of, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt anybody. Um, I just wanted to bring up one last comedy, uh, which is kind of also sci-fi, but Red Dwarf. Oh my goodness! Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. Um, I I can't tell you how hard I laughed. I caught it in Nashville in the '80s on public television um, when I was a kid before I ever moved to England, and I caught the episode where they were in the backwards universe. And I cannot tell you how much I laughed at that, that that's, in the floor. It's backwards, by the way. That episode. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's one of the funniest things I think I've seen in my forty, <laughs> almost forty-three years on this planet. And I still, I still watch it and and blow blow soda everywhere. <laughs> it's, um, wonderful. it's one of the it's one of the wonderful. best things I've ever seen. Um, and I've and I'm so proud that I saw it basically at the you know, in the year of its broadcast, you know, when I was a kid. So, yeah, it's a great so, show. And it got brought back recently and it's still great. I mean, it's not yeah. as good as the original days, but it's still, they've done it. They went they brought it back and uh, it's not the same production crew behind it, but the same people, same crew. And uh, they haven't ruined it, which is strange because it was a brilliant show. Rat Boys from the Dwarf. Yeah. So, again, the world made of cardboard. Thank you very much. I said, loving the stream, but he must go cut grass. Mm. So uh, good luck with that. No. <laughs> I'm just, just quickly, Michael, I, I would like to thank you for bringing up Red Dwarf because mm -hmm. it would have been an absolute sin for us to not mention that on yeah. this stream. I don't know why it, uh, why it hasn't been made, but that's, um, that is absolute classic TV to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, a, what an incredible show. Yeah, it rides that line between sci-fi yeah. and comedy, so it, it can fall through. But like, just knowing that they they did that whole thing where that guy is like a is like a thousands of years in the future evolved cat. I mean, that is brilliant <laughs> writing. 
Millions, you know? actually. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And thing is, it it like you just said, Michael. It's so there are episodes of Red Dwarf that are hard science fiction, and mixed with British comedy seamlessly. And it's all because mm -hmm. of that wonderful, you know, especially when uh, the original writers were doing it together. They've had since had a falling out and they're suing each other. But uh, uh, the better episodes and uh, with that cast. They've tried two times to make American uh, pilots, um, including Robert Lellum was even one of them. They both bought and mis bombed miserably because it just doesn't need to be done over here. It's mm -hmm. perfect the way it is. It's a great, it's a brilliant show. One of the greatest ever. Yep. Yeah. So I guess we'll do our last look at the BBC's uh, listings. And this time we're up to September the 2nd, 1988. So I'm expecting the BBC at this point will be broadcasting a certain show from Australia. <laughs> Twice a day, in fact. But anyway, CFAX, again, it was just the, basically pre-internet. It was information on the screen that you could somewhat control. Edgar Kennedy. My memories of CFAX, Dean, that it never, ever worked for us. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Maybe my parents just had a cheap TV or something. <laughs> Edgar Kennedy, I think, was possibly, was that the silent TV era? Black and white? Um, could be. Uh, again, the weather, then breakfast time was just your morning breakfast show. Well, Flash Gordon's trip to Mars was definitely the black and white TV yeah, show. No, yeah. actually, it was, the, it was the movie serials with Buster Crabb, according to this. Oh. That's uh, from the 30s. Buster, there was yeah. a TV show in the 50s, but this was uh, in the 30s. They had uh, several movie serials uh, uh -huh. based on the Alex Raymond comics oh, for Flash yeah. Gordon. And uh, yeah, Buster Crab right there. So I guess yeah. they ran that each week. There were quite a few of them. So Yeah, so, so I guess yeah, it was so like 20, 20 minutes worth. Yes, there were that three was serials. playing in 1988, and I remember <laughs> uh, around that time in England, they would also be showing uh, like Johnny Weissmuller, Black and White Tarzans, oh, um, yeah. Zorro. Yeah. I was a huge fan of the old Black Zorro, and White Zorros. Yeah. Um, lots of the, the Buster Crab serials. Yeah, love them. So after Flash Gordon, we had news and weather. Uh, but first, this was for kids, and it started with the Pink Panther show, which I used to enjoy. The oh, cartoon. Yeah. Nice. And Why Don't You was a show made for kids by kids and I couldn't stand it because I hated seeing kids telling me what to do <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe that's just me Laurel and Hardy I think was the cartoon version could be of news play school was a show for infants 5 to 11 I really do not recall that at all what time is um, that on at 5 to 11 <laughs> <laughs> yeah that makes sense <laughs> News, uh, Superman, I think would have been the the black and white. I'm sure it would have been. Uh, last in the series, I'm so Yeah, it that's was, uh, looks like the George Reeves old show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Seven Souvenirs was the episode. More yeah, news, definitely more definitely news that. and weather, more news, and then we had neighbors for the first time in this day. So neighbors were shown twice a day. In yep. the UK, so one thirty, then at uh, ten to two, we had Dallas with Larry Hagman. Ah, uh, this is a, a rather bizarre title for a show. They were only sixteen, but this refers to the a couple of kids who were sixteen and wished to become the Torval and Dean of roller skating. So Torval and Dean were the <laughs> world famous ice skaters. So. You know, scintillating scary, was very popular in the UK in the late yeah. 80s. Yeah. Uh, Children's BBC starting out with a, a Popeye cartoon. Steel Riders, I do not recall at all. No. Uh, Tony, remember that? No? No, I don't. No. Nah. News Round, uh, basically a news show for kids. Think It, Do It, presented by Johnny Ball. Now, he was like a, a scientific mathematician kind of guys his shows were somewhat educational then we had the rerun of neighbors which is when most people actually watched it after school of course i just, just goes to show how popular that show was yeah. in England at the time yeah they had to air it twice a day and that's it, right I, I can remember being being a kid my my sister was 
totally enamored with that show. Um, but my mum only worked part time, so certain days of the week um, when she wasn't at work, she could catch the lunchtime one, and it would always frustrate my sister that mum got to watch it before she yeah. did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had news, more news. Wogan was a chat show. Yeah, preview of the autumn shows on BBC. Then Best of British was a look at some of the greatest uh, British sports stars. 22 years of the two Ronnies mm. would have been a great show. Uh, yeah. Nine o'clock news. Now, I'm going to say this is pronounced play for Real because it was a show about Real Falkirk who were, I believe, a Subutio team. And Subutio was like table soccer. Yep. A bizarre premise for a, a drama. Uh, <laughs> Omnibus at the Proms was a classical music kind of concert. The late film was The Heist, featuring Warren Beatty and Goldie Hawn. Hmm. Then we had the weather, and then we were done for the night. So, as you can see, not exactly great viewing, to be honest. Um, no, I, I, I remember around that time in, in the 80s, you know, probably 80% of what I would be watching would be on ITV. Yeah. I think I, I would agree with that. There's all, like I said earlier, all the cool shows were on ITV. Your A teams, your Night Riders, Buck yeah. Rogers, yeah, yeah. Battlestar yeah. Galactica. Yeah, also, yeah. I I'm pretty certain it was it was ITV that gave us the Star Wars movies at Christmas time. Yes. Indiana Jones always ITV. Um, I think yeah, BBC Chris, yeah, were, Christmas Day it was always a, a, a big thing in in the UK. You would get a really big movie and. It would be one of the Star Wars films would be yeah. aired, um, and I, I think, and you, you would often get an Indiana Jones as well, and it was a real highlight, like Christmas oh, Day, yeah. to get, like Raiders and, of the Lost Ark and The Empire Strikes Back played on, on one day. Yeah. And, yeah. And, when you and only got four forget. channels and they're not all that good, like BB, I don't think I ever watched BBC Two in my entire life. Like, well, oh, in my childhood, I should no, say. Child, no, <laughs> never. And the thing as well, bidding in mind, this is before on demand, so. And even prior to having VCRs, you had to watch it when it was broadcast, and that made it more of a special occasion. I just remember when I would read the uh, TV Times, Radio Times at Christmas, I would see what was going to be broadcast on Christmas Day, and I would be so excited knowing that one of my favorite movies was going to be broadcast, and you had to basically plan your day around that, because if you didn't watch it there and then, you missed it. Yeah, And I actually would like to go back to that way of life again, because right now with the whole on-demand thing, we've become, or, or I should say, I've become kind of lackadaisical in that I think I can watch it some other time. And honestly, I never get around to it. But back then, when they had your favorite movie or whatever it was on the TV, you had to be there at a certain time, gathered around with the family, and it became a really big special event which i guess sadly we no longer do these days yeah um, it, it you know on the other on the other hand and i'm not trying to be a devil's advocate at all yeah. i think you've made very valid points mm -hmm. um because i do pine for some of that as well uh yeah. to return but there's a there's a flip side to that which i have found because of that because i've thought about this a lot too is that it makes me realize what what entertainments and what shows and things like that i'm not that willing to invest my time into anymore because if i want to watch it i will make the time to watch right. it like i'm literally flipping you know discs right now i'm watching like a few weeks ago it was one disc of robin of sherwood one disc of only fools and horses one disc of robin of sherwood one disc of only <laughs> so i was so i was like really you know you know, now I've just gotten a new Doctor Who set from the Blu-ray collection of season 24, and now I'm going to be able to go through that as soon as Iconicon -Icon is over. I want to watch that. Right. Um, but certain certain things, you know, like I love Star Wars, but I've seen it like 500 yeah. times. Do I need to yeah. watch it again? Not anytime yeah. soon, you know? No, no. So. I mean, but certainly, and also as well, for me, I saw the Star Wars movies in the wrong sequence. Uh-huh. Hmm. Um, yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah. I, if I remember rightly, I saw Star Wars on TV. I saw Return of the Jedi at the theater, 
and mm -hmm. then Empire Strikes Back on VHS hired from the local video store. Yep. So when I saw Return of the Jedi, I couldn't quite understand why Han Solo was frozen and stuck to <laughs> the wall. Uh huh. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So wicked person again. Thank you so much. You said Chris Rimmer, Barry of Red Dwarf, is an impressionist from Spitting Image. Mm -hmm. He read the Red Dwarf audiobooks and did the cat. Yes. He also did a show called British Empire. Right. And Master Sun 42, again, thank you, has said, I'm concerned on your cartoons. I stepped away, so I may have missed it. Did you show a Saturday schedule? Uh, no. Um, honestly, I just had to pick three days at random. But given the access to the BBC's website, I'm sure I'll do more videos looking at certain uh, days that were broadcast in the UK. And I think we're up to date. So we're at one hour 20 already. So that's flown by. The last mm -hmm. seg segment was going to be uh, children's TV shows. But we can, I don't know if, did well, many British make it over to America or? Well, I was going to tell, it's a perfect dovetail because I was, I was going to tell Master Son, um, if he's interested in, in British uh, children's television and those, uh, those uh, schedules, um, then uh, you need to look up DJ Cat because that show, I believe, started in the late 80s and it was on when I was there. It had been running for a while and they were the ones that got to run Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles and Samurai Pizza Cats and all of those what we would have considered in America the equivalent of Saturday morning cartoons. I can't remember if DJ Cat was only on weekends or if it was in the afternoons. It's hard for me to remember. Um, but uh, yeah, so Master Son, start there. Um, yes, and uh, Jason mentions yes, we got we had Nickelodeon, and in the early '80s, I was another show I was obsessed with uh, uh, was Danger Mouth. I loved I loved that cartoon so much from ITV, I believe it was. It made, was indeed. Although was, for me, was that was wonderful. A that was a rather bittersweet show because my initials are also DM, <laughs> which Danger Mouse wore proudly on his chest. So yes. I was therefore known as Danger Mouse. I had a shirt. <laughs> I had a long sleeve white shirt with a turtleneck, which had the DM airbrushed on it, just like Danger Mouse. So yes, I love the show too much. It was so great, though. Yeah, and Pen Penfold was voiced by the lead character of Only Fools and Horses. Oh, that's right. And David Jason, Jason. Yeah. sir. David Jason. Yeah. Um, do you do you have any fond memories of Grange Hill, Tony? Um, I have more fond memories of Tucker's Luck. Wow. Okay. If you remember that, yeah, it, remember was, that. That, that that was a spin-off of Grange Hill, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It was. Yeah. 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 So. T Tucker, the, the character in Grange Hill, he was he he was he was the bad kid. He wore the leather jacket. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I, I I don't remember watching a lot of Grange Hill, but I do remember watching Tucker's Luck. I all I can say about Grange Hill is I have one memory etched in my brain, which has served me well in life. Um, they had one storyline where one of the characters, Zamo Maguire, became hooked on heroin. Yeah. And in one episode. It ended with Zamo passed out with his, I, I guess it was a spliff he was doing it. It was some strange way he was smoking it. But anyway, I thought he had died. And as a young kid, seeing one of my favorite characters die, that for me made me determined I would never touch hard drugs in my life. And it seemed to have worked. That was a fantastic PSA. And I think the cast of Grange Hill went to the White House to meet Nancy Reagan, who was doing yeah. the Just Say No campaign. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the kids of Grange Hill recorded a song called Just Say No, which was a dreadful song. But that really stuck in my mind, seeing Zamo, who I thought had died. And uh, although on the flip side, having watched Grange Hill, I was really scared to, to go to high school. Because I assumed I was going to get my head stuck down the toilet and all sorts, which was, you know, depicted on Grain Chill as all these bullying older kids and things. But uh, yeah, so Grain Chill, uh, do you remember Rainbow? Of course, Zippy Bungle and George. Yeah, <laughs> um, I, I don't know if that made its way across the Atlantic, 
but if you ever get the chance uh, on YouTube, it's there. The, the the crew of Rainbow recorded a special adult version of the song. Just need to close that. They did a not the song, but they made a special adult version of the kids show just for their own benefit. Have you seen that? No, I haven't. I still remember oh. the Rainbow song though. Up above the streets and houses. House <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not a singer. The I'm whole a world with a rainbow. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Yeah. Um, it's funny how these things stick in your mind, but that was another great kids show. But I, I, I urge you to Google the adult version of Rainbow. Um, and thought I missed one here. Uh, so we got Prime Syndicate. Guys, remember Press Gang? I don't. I don't. No. Uh, um, I don't. And, and Gen X Toys Geek, you have one here about uh, DJ the Cat was on Sky Channel, not BBC, uh, and was weekdays. DJ, no, I I have no memory of that whatsoever. Yeah, I guess I, I maybe maybe you didn't have Sky in '86. No, no, well, no, I didn't. No. Yeah, so I think that's probably why oh, when we got ABC. there. In, okay. Yeah, yeah, when we got there in '90, we we had Sky and and right. it was a big thing. Simon in the land of chalk drawings. Mm. I, you know, that sounds so familiar. Yeah. But no, like no images are coming into my head. But I, I'm like, I know that name. Yeah. Um, w one children's show that I've already covered in a previous YouTube video was an educational show called The Boy from Space. Mm. And that was compulsory viewing in primary school. And it absolutely traumatized a lot of us. And from reading the comments in my video, every one of this age group either wet the bed or had nightmares because they were forced to watch this show. And the the evil character in the show was acted by uh, a Doctor Who veteran who I'm going to probably butcher his name. It was somebody would not. Um, I don't know if that rings any bells, but he, he played this menacing looking alien. And for whatever reason, they thought it was a good idea to show this to like six year old kids. And as a result, we were all traumatized. It was probably before your time, Tony, actually. I think yeah, I, I, I would, I'm not familiar with that. I might have been the last year to have been forced to watch this, but it was a hell of a thing to show the kids. <laughs> so we're actually getting close to the end here. So I should have said this at the beginning, but we had Scuba Pete moderating the chat on this oh, stream. I want to say Scuba Pete. a big thank you to Pete for that. Uh, I don't think there were any nasty people coming in tonight. Um, so I'm going to say, I don't, want to, I don't want this to come across the wrong way, but thankfully, this is my last participation <laughs> in, in Iconicon. Uh, I, I, I don't mean that in, the, in a bad way. I just mean that today has been, for me, it's been like boom, 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 boom. Uh -huh. and now I can sit back and just watch the shows. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so for me, I'm done. So go ahead and promote what you guys have coming up for Iconicon. Mike, do you want to go? Oh, oh no. well, yes. Saturday, uh, Michael has me on two panels back to back, buddy. Uh, we, of course, going to be talking about James Bond films of the '80s, and uh, we, Michael, and I've talked about James Bond a lot. We're both Bond fans, so that's going to be fun. And then Michael with a sense of humor, put me on a Return of the Jedi panel. <laughs> or was that Melinda? I don't know. Uh, Melinda, Melinda scheduled you for that. I, when I, cause she, she knows why she did it. She knows. I love so, you, Melinda. Yeah. <laughs> but I love it, you know, but I, I, I'm a comedian. Yeah. Cruel to it. But yes, yeah, so that's my Iconicon itinerary coming up and I cannot wait. That's, I don't have the times right in front of me though. Um, so we'll just, we can put that uh, Iconicon schedule in there, I'm sure. Yep. I'll look it up on the playlist. While, on the playlist uh, there. While Tony gives us uh, his next Iconicon adventures. And if I can just interject, uh, Jody, yeah. again, thank you. One and a half hours is far too short to talk about. It. Yes, it, it is too short, but we had to condense it as best we could. So I think we covered a reasonable 
amount of topics. I mean, we, we could have gone on for a whole year talking about this stuff. Yeah, there could be a whole channel just called yeah. Vintage Brit TV. Yeah. Um, yes. Hmm, yes. That's a good does idea. Any, does anyone remember there Stick of the Dump? Go. Oh. <laughs> Stick of the Dump, yeah. Yeah. That just popped into my head, but uh, oh, wait, no, wait, Dean, wait, I'm, I'm actually sorry. Go ahead, yeah. Mike. No, I'm just going to ask Dean. We had the Tomorrow People also. Was that the 70s or 80s though? The Tomorrow uh, People. No, Nickelodeon ran that when they would run Danger Mouse. You know, no one remembers that. Maybe it's 70s. Uh, I'm I don't really that. don't recall you know that, that one. Right. Yeah, Peter Davis would even guess it on an episode. Okay, science fiction mm. show. Mm. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry about that. Tell me good. But. That's all right. I'm, I'm, I'm actually very envious of you, Dean, because I could, I know you're, you're all wrapping up your participation yeah. in Iconic Con now. I'm only just starting. <laughs> <laughs> I with you Dean, last night. Dean yeah. don't let Tony do this to you. You see, because Tony is one half of the reason this happened. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so he has to pay his dues on this. I, thankfully... <laughs> I can absolve myself of that very responsibility. Yeah. I, I wasn't mean, the other half. Yeah. I, I have to be honest and say that last night I was basically shitting myself, thinking, how am I going to get through all of this? <laughs> uh, all these, all, all this technical issues with, I've got two laptops going, I've got screen sharing, I'm trying to monitor chats. Thankfully, I got through it unscathed. And I think... It's been a reasonable success. So, mm -hmm. I like think I said, been... I'm glad it's over, but I don't mean that in a bad way. But yeah, please, I get, I get what you're saying. I get what yeah. you're saying. I dream of the day you're about to have. Yeah, I mean, I'm, <laughs> like, like I'm loving it. I'm loving everything about it. I'm hoping that all the channels we're partnering with are getting more exposure, growing, and all that stuff. I want all that to happen. But I'm also looking forward to being able to just kick my shoes off and just yeah. You know, so <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like I'm doing shift work because of the time difference with Australia. I'm like, oh, yeah. I slept for, I sat down to, or laid down to sleep for three hours yesterday afternoon because I had to be up late in the evening, uh, and um, set my alarm and slept straight through it. I don't think I mentioned this, Dean. I woke up like 20 minutes before I jumped on your oh, wow. show yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> woke up in this panic. Like, Have I missed it? Have I missed it? But. Um, right. Uh, but I'm up literally in 30 minutes on G.I. Joburg, and I think uh, Mike will be on there as well with Max I, Stockwood and Steve. I yep. could say as well that coming up at 9.45, G.I. Joburg is premiering, or premiering his review of the Tomahawk from yes. Hasbro's G.I. Joe line. So that's nice. the next item on Iconicon. And then, Tony, you're live. Um, straight after that straight on G.I. Joburg, and okay. we're debating... Um, the Which comics. are the, uh, the first and second series of comics of the first half and the second half of the first yeah. hundred issues? Oh, were so nice. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to it. Okay. Yep. And uh, cool. so, Michael, you want to promote anything quickly, or I I want to promote um, sleep being, being reasonable with your meaning into the general, not you specifically, the general you being reasonable in our and our expectations of how much sleep we actually will get over the next yeah. few days. <laughs> Being ready to face that challenge with minimal complaints. Um, and also knowing that all of the stuff that we end up finding in our reserves to sit down and do has all been great so far. Um, it's been a really, really good online event and it's continuing to go well. We worked out our technical kinks from yesterday. So we've had a really good day today. Tiring, but good, like yeah. you said, Dean. I'm not meaning tiring in a bad way, just kind of being matter of fact about it. But uh, yeah, it's been a good event so far and I'm, I'm looking forward to the next few days. Yeah. All right. Thanks, so man. that right there wraps things up for this stream. So again, thank you to our panelists. Wonderful guests tonight. Thank you all for watching. Thank you for the super chats. Incredibly generous. Like I said, coming up next on the GI Joburg channel, premiere of the Tomahawk and see you next time so thank you all and be oh quickly we have a super chat from tree theodore nice work gentlemen thank you tree good night everyone see you next time good night everyone see you guys i'll see you soon